talking about African American history in Clark County. Most of the African Americans that lived in Clark County in the, in the 19th century were, they, did, they came here from Kentucky after the Civil War. I'm not sure who all of the names were before the Civil War, but we had quite a few And that was told to me by Richard Lumen, who also lived out there. And it was Sunday, and Richard was a kid. He just died recently. He was almost 100 years old. And the Oglesby family were friends of theirs. And the Oglesby family, these children all belonged to that couple in the middle. So there were a lot of Oglesby's. They were dressed up and come down the road in the wagon on their way to church. Well, Mr. Lumen and his little buddy... They were not in church that day. They were trying to get a baby skunk away from the mother. And they were having troubles with it. So one of them grabbed the, the mother skunk by the tail and he whirled her and whirled her around. And then he threw her just as the old dudes were coming in their wagon. And you know what happened. The skunk fell in the wagon and it sprayed all of them. And he was so ashamed of that. They didn't do it on purpose. But he was so ashamed of that even when he was an old man. He had bad feelings about it. So so that's where they were from. And then you had George the Baptist, who was up in Mass around Madison, Indiana. He was a famous Underground Railroad conductor. And that's Leora Brown. She taught the school, one of the African American schools in Corridon. Those are the 1904 graduates of Taylor High School, and their teacher is on the end, Robert Frank Taylor. He was a graduate of Jeffersonville High School, and he made the highest grades in the class, but the white people on the school board didn't want to give him a certificate because he was black, and he showed up the white kids and made them look not so hot. So they gave him a, a separate certificate, and then they gave the valedictorian position to some, some white kid that was at that school. But they hired him, he was brilliant, they hired him to be the first teacher of the African American School over here on uh, Wall Street. The building's still standing and it's named in his honor. He's buried in Eastern Cemetery in the African American section of the WFM. What can I say? So, uh, that's all about Floyd County, but we're not talking about that. Here's a couple of pictures that I brought in. You can come up and look at them whenever you finish the evening if you want to. This building, guess what this building was? And you can't, you can just barely see it right here because they had all kind of warehouses built up in here between World War I and World War II. The place was full of extra warehouses where they sold they store stuff. Right here under my fingers, you can just barely see a part of this building. Anybody got an idea of what it was? Well, I'll tell you, this is probably the first and last time you will ever eat lunch in the restaurant. Whoa. 
this building. This one right here? Yes, sir. It was divided down the middle. So between probably between those two windows, and of course this has been built out. It's kind of that was there. And part of it was for men, and part of it was for women. They had other restrooms inside the long buildings at church places inside the long buildings, but this was for African Americans. It was built sometime after World War I and before 1925, because that's the first mention. There's a drawing of it in the Sandworth Pirate Church there, of 1925. So that's about when it was built. African Americans did work here. Uh, you had, uh, where's Mr. Trueheart? There he is. You had Samuel Trueheart, whose father was Peter Trueheart. Peter was enslaved down in Kentucky, and he came to Jeffersonville and made enough money working to buy his wife out of slavery. So he got her, they got up here, they lived right across the street. And this land where you are right now was a part of the African American church. And Dr. Nathaniel Field, here he is, he was kind of like the white head of the Underground Railroad, and then there were African Americans like Joshua, Joshua Dunlap and Harriet, his wife, that moved down here from Patriot, Indiana, also on a peninsula like Jeffersonville, and slaves would escape across from Kentucky, and I'm sure the True Hearts were helping him. Well, about 1847, Harriet True Heart comes down here, she buys a lot on, on uh, Walnut Street, about where St. Luke's Church is, I don't know if you're familiar with that, Mabel and Walnut, and they've got a little house there, and the only way I know about them was after the war, about 1870, they moved to Indianapolis, and he ran a store up there. There's a little tiny obituary in one of our local papers that says uh, that he had died, and he was a substitute broker during the Civil War, and it says he ran off many slaves from Kentucky. So they came through Jeffersonville. Jeffersonville was the first and largest underground railroad route in Indiana. You never hear anything about it because nobody's ever done the research on it. But it's always New Albany and Madison. But we were in the, the very bowels of the devil you know, over here. And we had both kind of people here. We had good people that wanted to help other people regardless of what color they happened to be. And then you had people that would capture free blacks over here in Indiana and take them across the Louisville, which was a slave state, mm -hmm. of course, Kentucky, and they would put them in jail and they would get paid a bounty for each one of them that had in jail. Well, nobody claimed them, and believe me, nobody claimed them because they were free. They didn't belong to anybody. Well, then after two weeks, they were sold down the river into slavery. So we had both kind of people here. We weren't all good, but we weren't all bad either. So it was really dangerous here. So Dr. Field, he came over here in 1829. His dad was a soldier in the Revolutionary War and a slaveholder. And uh, Dr. Field hated slavery. He was the head of... Uh, I forget the name of it, but it was an organization in Indiana that was anti-slavery. Probably was the name of it. He even published a newspaper that kind of made it down south to some of the towns down there, and they actually threatened his life in their newspaper. Threatened to come up here and lynch him because he was helping African Americans in this state. So he was the pastor. He was a medical doctor during the Civil War. He was also the pastor of the Advent Christian Church in Jeffersonville. He never took a penny of salary for that. And uh, even his wife was an abolitionist. So we find through research that that whole little church was full of abolitionists. And the women had their role in all of this, too. They weren't, you know, out there with the wagons and, and you know, with the men moving them from town to town. The women would raise money. They'd have church dinners and what have you and make things to sell in that way. I know Mrs. Mary Affleck was a member of that church, and she was arrested at, for buying a railroad ticket for escape, a slave to escape. That was in the 1850s that that happened. But slavery lasted a long time. In Kentucky during the Civil War, it wasn't over until 1865. 1863 is when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed by President Lincoln. 
got in trouble over in Louisville. He used to come through Jeffersonville and there was no bridge across the river, okay? So all they had was the ferry. And he and Mrs. Field would ride the ferry to get back and forth to Louisville. And one time, Lincoln came to Jeff, bought his ticket, got on the ferry, and it was in the 1840s, and he was working over in Louisville. This is before he became president, of course, and all that stuff. And he worked near the slave market, and he saw an enslaved person being abused by the master when it was the master's smart aleck son that did something wrong, and they took it out on the slave, and Lincoln got in a fight, and all of a sudden there was a mob, and they chased him out of Louisville, back across the river, I think down, you used to be able to cross the river down by Clarksville, because the river was way shallower than today, and in dry weather, you could walk across certain places. He ran across the river and got away from them, but that was the only way, they almost got him. So, you had all that kind of thing going on. One time, Dr. and Mrs. Field, Mrs. Field had gone to Louisville, they had family over there, she was from there, and she's coming back on the ferry, and this black man dares to get on the ferry. And he sits down, and uh, the, the ferryman that was running the job came up to him and, and hit him with something and told him to get on, get on off of here and this and that. Well, Miss Field had a fit. She took her umbrella and she beat that man over the head with it, and she prosecuted him in court for it. She wasn't afraid of anybody. She was brave. So the Field family ran up to their necks. They lived over on Maple Street in Jeff, East Maple, uh, West Maple, I'm sorry. Uh, and he stood up against the entire county. Just one man in his house with one friend, and all he had was a knife. He was a man of God. And the, yeah, they were voting on uh, uh, the new constitution, I think it was, in Indiana that punished people for help trying to help slaves and he was against it and they wanted to drive all the enslaved people that had escaped out of Indiana because they they were becoming a financial burden supposedly and he stood up and voted against it and there was a mob outside of his house that surrounded his house and they were out there all night and threatened to kill him and he said come on he wasn't afraid so he was a good guy that's Dr. Phil Reverend Calvin Fairbanks he wasn't from here. He was from Overland, Ohio. Let me tell you a little bit about Overland. That's where Overland College is. They were one of the earliest colleges to accept African Americans into their class. And they would finance the establishment of African American, African -American settlements in different towns all along the river with the border of Kentucky. So they would pay and they would get a minister, a black minister, to come down here and start a church. And then those people in that congregation would become members of the Underground Railroad. So Overland College was heavily involved in that. That's where Fairbank was from. He successfully got an enslaved lady named Tamar across the river, and he hid her in a field over here. And he went and rented a buggy and a horse, and then he went back to the field and picked her up, and they were suspicious of him, the catchers were, and he like to beat that horse to death if he drove out uh, Old 60, which is one of the underground railroad routes through Clark County. And it went to Salem, Indiana, which was a Quaker settlement. There was a black man who was a barber at Salem, and he was the conductor of the next station. Well, he got Tamar out there. And then when Fairbank came back, they arrested him. He spent 17 years in the penitentiary in Frankfort, Kentucky, and nearly beat him to death. But when he finally got out, he got out of the wagon. I guess they brought him to Ohio. He got out of the wagon and kissed the ground and went right back into the other ground river. So there were there were some good people uh, around. Of course, Lottie Oglesby's from one of the old family here. You had people that freed African Americans in their wills or in deeds. The manumission records are all in deed books. And I abstracted 40 books pulled all the names out, and there's such poignant stories in there. Some of the African Americans were half white. In other words, the slave owner was their father. And you can see it in there, and she used to be kept and have her, her clothing and food and this and that, and she's not to be treated harshly, and that's when you know that's the father of that child. So there's some of that in those books also.
So uh, Quartermaster Depot was a place where African Americans could get jobs. And uh, Peter Trueheart, Sam's father, the Trueharts live right across the street over here, but all those houses are gone now. And he worked at the depot. And they mostly had menial jobs like making bricks or moving bricks around or doing whatever it was that they, they did. But as time went on, they gradually got more and more power. And when war happened, most of the white men were drafted first. And that meant that African Americans and women could move up the hierarchy into better paying jobs. And by the time World War II comes around, you've got women uh, working in the, making web belts and, and doing all kinds of, kind of stuff at the depot. And uh, you've got the men driving forklifts, which they never did before. So economic justice made its appearance when all that sort of thing happened. And so uh, let's see, let's go over here. This talks about Indiana and the laws. <clears throat> Slavery was illegal in Indiana, thanks to a bunch of men from Clark County and thanks to the governor, the first governor, Jonathan Jennings. He was an abolitionist, and a lot of the men were from up around Charlestown. And in 1804, they held a convention because they saw old William Henry Harrison. He was born back in Virginia. Slavery was all he knew, and he wanted it to be in Indiana, too. And so he was over by Vincennes run by the French since 1749 and uh, he wanted to try to sneak it in so he petitioned Congress to go ahead and let slavery be legal in Indiana and the men in Clark County had their convention and they wrote up this paper that's called the Doctrine of Squatter Sovereignty. In order to defeat Harrison they wrote this uh, law or, or document and it said wait Indiana's not a state yet. Don't go ahead and make it a slave state. Wait until it's settled and you've got enough people that Indiana can come into the Union as a state and Congress bit right on that. And they said no to William Henry Harrison. And when Jennings became governor, slavery became illegal in Indiana. They called it indentured servitude, and there's lots of indentures in those key books that I was talking about. But there's also a lot of man commissions where people were set free. So that's the, basically the story of uh, Clark County, Indiana. Is that why it's called a crossroads, Indiana? I think so. There were different routes. You, you need to come to the museum sometime. It doesn't cost yes. anything. It's free to the public. We only ask for donations if anybody feels like making one. But we actually have a map that shows you the ways they went up through Indiana to get to the Michigan Road. And that brings up, brings up another story. It is so sweet. I met these two old ladies that live up in Bloomington, and they were from Clark County, and they lived out in Nab. Nab, New Washington, is way out in the country. And Mr. McNabb, James McNabb, the, the settlement was named for, he was an abolitionist. And that is where Highway 3, you go up 62 and you cut over and go through Charlestown, that's Highway 3, and Highway 3 is the Michigan Road. So, one day in 1860, old Aunt Polly Robinson was out, and she was walking to the store, I guess, in New Washington. They lived on Nath and Washington Road. And there's a big bridge. There's a big bridge that crosses over uh, the creek down below. And she's walking along and she looks down and she sees something under the bridge. Well, it's a boy. And he's black. And she made him come out. And she asked him and he says, my name is George Hayes. And uh, I got a mean stepmother now. She beats me and she makes me take care of the horses. And he said, I ain't never going back. That's what he said to her. She said, well, you come along with me. It's 10 years old, you know. So she gets him and they, they continue to walk in to town, to the store. And he tells her, the sheriff's after me. I know the sheriff's after me, but I ain't going back. So she got him in the store. They're inside and she looks out and here comes the sheriff. So she takes him to the back of the store and she dresses him in a bonnet and gloves and a dress and she said, we're gonna walk right out past the sheriff. Don't look up and don't, don't talk. They walk out 
Sheriff goes, ma'am, and she goes, Sheriff. They get outside and they hightail it for home. And nobody, he lived in New Washington the rest of his life with Aunt Polly, and nobody in New Washington ever told he was the only black man in New Washington. Well, he stayed with that family. Aunt Polly died, oh, I guess about 1912 or so. And uh, <clears throat> George lived on their farm, but he would not eat with them in the house. They begged him to come in and eat. We've got nice hot food. There's no reason. He said, no, it ain't right. They tried to get him. They made a room for him in the house. He wouldn't sleep in the house. It ain't right. So they built a little house for him out in the yard, and they took his meals out to him. And he did farm chores. And, you know, he was just as happy as a clam. And, you know, he was getting started to get up there in his 20s. And Aunt Polly said to him, George, don't you want to go amongst your own people and look for maybe a look for a wife? No, he said. Well, they insisted, so he took a two weeks vacation. He was back after a week, and she questioned him about it. Didn't you find somebody that you could like, you know, that you could marry? He said, I ain't going to live with them people. So he stayed at Aunt Polly's for Pete's sake. One of his jobs was he took care of the boys in the family. And, of course, there was no birth control, so there were lots of kids. And he had taught the boys how to hunt, how to fish, how to do farm chores. And he would have sort of like cookouts. He'd take them out in the woods, and they'd have a fire, and they'd sit around, and he'd tell them stories about when he was a boy and all this stuff. And they had one baby that was born. Something was wrong with it, the Robinsons did, a little boy. And he was always sick and he almost died. And George used to carry him around on his hip all over the farm. And he called him his little white angel. Well, in the 1920s, there was hard uh, economic times. And the Robinsons, they didn't lose the farm, but they didn't have any money. And uh, so they went to the poor farm. And they, they, the husband and wife, they worked at the poor farm up Highway 62. They've torn that building down now, but that's where they were living. And uh, George got sick, and they got word of it, and they got him and took him to the poor farm so he could get medical care. He died there in 1925, and he's buried in the poor farm with no tombstone or anything. But the Robinson family loved him like a rock. I'm not kidding. Those two old ladies that live up in Bloomington are descendants of the Robinson family. They gave me the only picture that exists of George Hayes. And he's got one little white baby on one knee and one little white baby on the other knee. And I have a picture of him at the museum, thanks to them. They have, that family never, ever forgot him. And those two old ladies, they're about ready to pass on. And the house they live in is just like a museum. So they're still living now? They're still living now? They're still living now, just barely. Mm. So they're sick. So they are the ones that told me that story. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known that. So you're free to look around if you want to, and I'll answer questions maybe if you have any. The worst, the worst is you said. It's at 8th and Spring Street. You know where that. You go back down to Spring Street here and you turn left and you go through a couple of lights and you're at 8th and Spring and we're in a pole barn looking building. It's concrete block and pole barn on the upper and it's right there on the right. That's the Clark County Museum. Mm -hmm. And we're always going. I'm sorry. I was going to just to go again. Oh, you were? And my dad's there you can talk to him. Oh, he is. What was his name? Charles Henry Taylor. Mm -hmm. Charles Henry Taylor. Mm -hmm. Is he related to Mr. Taylor, the principal of Taylor High? I don't know. I don't know either. I know he, I think he had a daughter, but I, and he had somebody from Cincinnati, Prince, Prince somebody. I, I can't remember what his last name was now because I'm getting old too. But he came down here for the funeral. Uh, and let's see, that was, uh, Okay, so what's his man's name? Well, my mind is gone. There was an 